Over the last couple of decades, we've all learned to rub on the sunscreen, but there are several new and quite interesting ways from vaccines to phone apps to help treat, prevent, and detect skin cancer. My guest today is Dr. Matt Goodman, a dermatologic surgeon in Santa Ana, California. Matt, thanks for coming. It's good to be here. You know, I'm wondering, is cancer on the rise in Southern California or anywhere in the United States? Or Skin cancer is an epidemic. Uh, the curve that shows the incidence of melanoma over the past a few decades is just going up and up and up. And there's probably many reasons for that. Uh, one is that the leisure time that was uh, begun in, in the 1950s and 1960s, it's taken uh, years of lag time for those uh, sunburns and all that sun to show up, but it's showing up now as higher incidences of melanoma and other skin cancers. So all those spring breaks I went to in college, I'm at risk now for cancer? Yeah, it's all registered in your skin <laughs> that DNA. <laughs> That's too bad. Jeez, should have told me. So um, now, what, what about all these sunscreens that are out? They haven't really helped us at all, or do they? What's the story you with know, the sunscreen? For years, uh, dermatologists have believed that uh, sunscreens had value in preventing skin cancer, but there was no good evidence. It was just a belief because it stood to reason. Sunscreens reduce the amount of ultraviolet that gets into your skin. But just this year in Australia, a great study was done looking at sunscreen mm -hmm. use, and it showed for the first time evidence, uh, scientific evidence, that there was a significant decrease, and this was a, over a 10-year period, a significant decrease in the incidence of melanoma in people who use sunscreen regularly versus those that didn't. Really. So now the sunscreens used to be c confusing. Now it's kind of the, the labeling's been changed somewhat. How, how do you explain this labeling? Well, uh, you know, it, it was a numbers game before that uh, the higher your SPF factor, you, the companies thought they could sell more. Uh, the FDA has gotten involved, and there's a new labeling system that is standardized, so all sunscreen makers will have to abide by this uh, labeling system, kind of like the new dietary mm -hmm. uh, labels, though they're not new anymore. Um, and so that uh, labeling system will simply show the three main, main things that uh, are important in evaluating, so the consumer can evaluate whether a sunscreen is for them or not. One is the SPF factor which we already know, but they're gonna put a cap on it at 50, not 80 or 100 or 110. Okay. They're also SPF stands for what? SPF, sorry, is a sun protective factor. Okay. And it's a, it's a guide or a gauge for how much protection there is. It can go from zero to uh, now 50 will be the, the limit. Uh, and then broad spectrum, which means ultraviolet B and ultraviolet A must both be protected against in order to qualify as broad spectrum because both UVA and UVB are uh, risk factors for skin cancer. And the last thing is water resistance, very important. Uh, it, sunscreen, by the way, sunscreen won't be called sunblock, it'll be called sunscreen because it's, it's not a perfect block. Same with water resistance, it, they won't be able to use the word waterproof, okay. it'll be water resistant and then it's measured at either 40 minutes or 80 minutes. Now that means it'll have to be reapplied uh, at least every 80 minutes if you're in the water. At least you know now. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. So would zinc oxide, is that the ultimate protect, that white stuff you put on, is that the ultimate block? It or? actually is. Zinc oxide is not considered a sunscreen because it's a chemical block oh, that physically blocks all light. It's a sun block and it's, it's basically, a, if you put it on thick, it's a hundred percent block. Okay. So what's the story with tanning booths? Are they really a, a cause of can, uh, skin cancer, a contributing factor? That also for a period of time was a belief, but uh, evidence was lacking whether or not it was a risk for skin cancer. The tanning salons, which are very common, uh, now have been shown to be a, a significant risk factor for common skin cancer and melanoma. So the, if you spend 10 minutes in a tanning booth, is that the same as like an hour in the sun? Is there kind of a, an equation or is it too variable? It's a good question. It's actually the reverse. Uh, tanning salons tend to be UVA, so if you spend an hour, or let's say 15 minutes in a tanning booth, it's, it's more like spending three or four minutes in the sun. The sun is much more concentrated. But the problem is people think it's safer, and so then instead of just spending 15 minutes or in the sun, they'll go to the tanning booth every day. Some, some people are almost addicted to those uh, tanning salons, and they'll go so much that it overwhelms their skin's oh, ability to, to um, 
avoid the damage. And what about the um, tanning creams that you can put on to color the, their skin color? So-called self-tanning creams yeah. uh, have nothing to do with sun protection, but they're also not known to have any risk factors to them. I like them. I think that they're a good substitute for people going to tanning salons or getting uh, sunlight tans. I'm going to use it for the next show then. How <laughs> about um, the types of cancer that you have? There's how many different types of, I imagine mean, there's a lot, but what are the three major ones? Yeah, the three major skin cancers, uh, by far the most common is basal cell carcinoma. And that's just a common locally growing skin cancer. Usually it's a, a little red, a little, kind of smooth, um, very common on sun exposed skin. The second is squamous cell carcinoma, which is a little rougher, also kind of red or skin colored usually. A little more aggressive if it's left untreated can spread. And then the third one, not as common as the first two, but much more dangerous and deadly is melanoma. Okay. Now there's some guidelines you've come, I guess, you've added to. What are the <laughs> guidelines that you would recommend for the, the ABCs of skin yeah, cancer? Yeah, it used to be the ABCs, uh, now the uh, American Academy of Dermatology uh, has gone to the ABCDEs and I've added F and G and here here are the uh, the basics for self-detection of melanoma or suspicious moles. The A is asymmetric and that is basically a mole that isn't perfectly round okay. or oval. B is border, a border that also isn't crisp and clean but has maybe a diffuse uh, blending of the mole into the surrounding skin. Okay. That's a danger sign. Color, C is color and that is the coloration of the mole itself isn't uniform. It can be dark, but if it's uniform, it's okay. If it's got shades of brown, or if it has red or white, uh, other colors within it, those are danger signs. D, diameter. Think of a pencil eraser, six millimeters or so, or larger, may be a risk factor. Not necessarily, but could be. E is um, evolving. So a mole that, in an adult, that should be staying put, not changing, if it's changing in size, color, or shape, then it um, may be at risk for changing into a melanoma. Now the F, um, I smile because I've made these up. These are the Goodman letters. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but it, it's helpful, and, it's, yeah. and these are useful. F is a funny-looking mole, or also called the ugly duckling, a mole that just doesn't match the rest of your moles it, in color or size or shape. If it stands out, it could be a danger sign. And then G is the great masquerader. And we're seeing more and more melanomas that have no pigment at all. In fact, they tend to be pink. A pink flat spot or a pink bump that lasts more than a month or two ought to be checked out. And just uh, lastly, there's, what about these um, full body photographs that you take? Are they, those worthwhile? Um, that is uh, more narrow in its use, but it's, for, it's really helpful for people that have more than 100 moles uh, if they look irregular, if they, some people just make funny looking moles, uh, it's good to help track them over time. We do one set of photos, they come in with the photos, and we just compare the, what their skin looks now compared with their baseline photos. And if any has changed, because my memory, the patient's memory, we're not all that uh, accurate. But with the photos, you can compare, and then if one stands out or changes or is new, will biopsy it. And just one last question. I heard there's a phone app, like an iPhone app for, and other types of phone apps for s melanomas or skin cancers. Are those worthwhile or? You know, technology is here, and, and it's gonna be helpful and refined as time goes on. That phone app has value in, in perhaps just bringing heightened awareness and conscientiousness about your skin and watching your moles. The danger is, though, if that phone app, uh, it's called the Mel app, I mm -hmm. think, if that app is used and shows a low risk factor, it may keep you from going to see your doctor for it to be checked out, when indeed it might need to be biopsy. Right. So awareness is the key, and see a, do see a doctor earlier than later, probably. Absolutely. Sooner than later. Absolutely. Thank you very much. It was a great discussion. I learned a lot, and I hope our guests did too.